Hello everybody. So in this video we're going to cover all of the blood vessel objectives about blood flow and blood pressure, all that kind of good stuff, causes, effects, that kind of thing. And we're going to be covering objectives 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Right? So objective number six is explain blood flow, blood pressure, and resistance, and relate each of the other blood fit uh, each and relate each other both figuratively and mathematically to one another, right? So blood pressure is hydrostatic. We can define blood pressure as the force of blood against the vessel walls. So your lovely time and lovely examples here are the pressures the children here are exerting on the walls of the tubes they are crawling through. Blood flow is the movement of blood through the vessels, tissues, or organs, right? We normally measure this in volume by time, right? We know from our last video and by thinking about things a little bit that blood pressure is going to be highest in the arteries and lowest in the veins. Resistance is a term we're going to be using a decent bit throughout this video. Normally, resistance is abbreviated with a capital R when we start talking about this. Um, resistance is the friction between blood and the blood vessels. Blood viscosity, which is how thick or sticky your blood is. Blood vessel length, so the longer the blood vessel that the blood has to flow through, the higher the resistance. And blood vessel radius, that is how wide it is. Right? So resistance is anything that is causing friction between blood and the blood vessels that's going to make things more difficult for the blood to flow from point A to B. Right? Um, to use, once again, these lovely pictures as examples, in this first one, you have a lovely child sliding through the tube. She does not have much resistance. She's just sliding down. She's happy, smiling, having a good time. In this other image here, you see Augustus Gloop from the Willy Wonka movies. This is the old 1960s version, um, not the one from the 90s with Johnny Depp. This one had Gene Wilder in it. Um, but you see Augustus Gloop here stuck in the tube because he was too wide and the chocolate milk cannot flow past him, right? His resistance is much greater. He got he was too wide. He slowed down and got stuck in that plastic tube. So pressure is now building up behind him. Um, generally speaking, when your blood pressure goes up, the reason why your blood pressure has gone up was an attempt to make your blood flow also go up. So an increase in blood pressure is going to mean an increase in your blood flow, right? I hope you guys are following that so far. Um, but if your peripheral resistance has gone up, that means your blood flow is going to slow down. So the better this slide is, the more children are wanting, going to want to go down this slide, right? So the higher the blood pressure, the more blood your body wants to flow. But the more resistance the slower that flow will be, just like Augustus Gloop here, right? And peripheral, peripheral resistance, which is a term I just used, is the most important factor that's influential, influencing local blood flow. And that can change with vasodilation and constriction. So peripheral resistance is local resistance in local blood vessels to keep blood in or out of an area. That means you may have good levels of resistance going down one leg, but you may have a blood clot in the other leg that's closet, that is causing way more resistance, so you're having other blood flow problems or circulation problems with the other leg, right? Talking about all of this means we need to discuss blood pressure. Right? We need to talk about chemicals and other such things that affect, low, that affect blood pressure. And this gets into objectives 7 and 10 
objective seven is describe the factors that influence blood pressure, including the ways it is regulated in your body. Objective 10 is describe how blood flow is regulated systematically as well as in specific organs. So we are talking all about blood flow here and what regulates the blood pressure, right? So some backup information from our heart unit, right? We remember that systolic pressure is ventricular contraction, diastolic pressure, was ventricular relaxation. Pulse pressure is something we can measure from this. It's the difference between systolic minus diastolic. That means if you have your typical blood pressure of 120 over 80, your pulse pressure should be 40 because 120 minus 80 is 40, right? Um, and you want your pulse pressure generally in a healthy person to be 25% of your systolic pressure. And we can also calculate something called the mean arterial pressure, which is the average pressure of the arterial blood, right? So that's the average pressure between systole and diastole, right? Do, 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 do. You can measure your pulse and heart rates in a number of places. Most of the time, if you are taking them for, you know, uh, your job or working with people, you're going to work right here with a radial artery. You take, you know, pulse on the wrist. If you're talking about a stethoscope or a blood pressure cup, you're using the brachial artery, uh, facial artery, or the common carotid if you're checking by neck right there. You can also use the temporal artery, and sometimes that's used more for infants. Um, it is possible to use the femoral artery. However, like, bear in mind I'm saying it's possible to use the femoral artery, but notice your femoral artery's location when we start talking about it, not in lab and not on a plastic model, but on a complete human with all of her parts and muscles and whatnot. This may be a medical option and may be used in extreme, you were just in a car accident and we're in, like rushing you into surgery kind of you know, extreme situations, you are not going to, as a medical professional, walk up to some random person in a doctor's office and take their pulse on the femoral artery, notice its location. That would be a, that would be a colossal lawsuit and you'd probably lose your license. You do not go grabbing a person around there. Um, so while it's possible to use that in the event of an emergency or extreme situation, this is going to be your very last resort. Um, you can also use the popliteal artery at the back of the knee. Um, and like I've told some of y'all in lab, sometimes if you're talking about people who are having difficulties with IVs and that kind of stuff around the arms and the wrists and the hands, you're going to take pulses and do this kind of thing from the foot of the bed, especially if it's an ICU patient and somebody's dealing with major wounds like at Grady's Trauma Center that are happening in the abdomen from a gunshot or a bad car accident, you may be taking the pulse at the, from the foot of the bed just to get that job done from this posterior tibial artery or the dorsalis pedis artery at the top of the foot. Depends upon what's going on up here in the main parts, right? So use your common sense with this for where you want your careers to go. Doctor's offices, you're going to be mostly dealing with blood pressure cuffs on this brachial artery. If you work in Grady Trauma Center, be prepared for anything. Right? Um, so what controls your blood pressure? Right? We need to talk about your blood pressure and all that kind of good stuff. We've talked about your cardiac output in previous videos and all that kind of good stuff. Multiple things can impact your blood pressure, right? You have baroreceptors or pressure receptors all throughout your body. And you also have autonomic reflexes. If you remember from A&P1, those are those reflexes that you just happen that you don't think about from your nervous system. Um, we, these readings mostly come from around the aortic arc, which feeds into vagus nerve number 10, or Roman numeral 10. Um, and the cardio cardioid sinus, right? That's your glossopharyngeal nerve number 9, right? If you guys are remembering your nerves from A&P1. Um, 
You also have short-term chemical chemical controls within your body that are going to control your blood pressures. Um, your body also does readings, like parts of your brain and other organs do, like read the blood that's flowing past them to help control these things. But your body reads your carbon dioxide levels that are in your blood, blood pH, oxygen levels. Um, there are respiration effectors, right? That means this kind of stuff or breathing, whether or not you're like scared and hyperventilating, or if you are having an asthma attack, how well your breathing can affect all of this with blood pressure, because it's going to try to make your um, stuff pump a little bit better. Um, all right. All of these things are signaled to your hypothalamus, because remember your hypothalamus was the part of the brain that translated between your nervous system and the other chemical signals that other parts of your body are picking up. So hypothalamus translates nerves to chemicals, right? And this also can be translated in other medullary centers, right? You have some short-term hormonal controls for all of this. Um, all that kind of good stuff. When your cardiac output goes up, there's going to be some vasoconstriction to help rein that in, right? If your body is releasing angiotensin too, that's a vasoconstrictor. We've talked about that hormone before, right? We've talked about um, atrial brain natriuretic peptide or ANP before. That was the vasodilator we spoke about during your endocrine unit. Um, that was antagonistic with aldosterone, which was the only thing that brought blood pressure down that we discussed like during your endocrine unit. Um, antidiuretic hormone we've already discussed that can antidiuretic hormone can cause vasoconstriction because antidiuretic hormone wants you to conserve water within your body. That means that's going to make your blood pressure go up if you have lots of antidiuretic hormone in you. Um, you have these things called endothelins. Those are vasoconstrictors, and they're released in response to low blood pressure. So if your body detects that you have low blood pressure or low blood flow, right? Um, your body will release those in order to try and raise your own blood pressure, right? Um, you have systemic and local vasodilation, inflammatory chemicals. So if you're having an immune response to, some, to something with histamine, kinines, those kind of things, those are all vasodilators that are going to make the blood vessels dilate around the area, um, in order to promote an immune response to a potential pathogen. Other things that we put into our own bodies, like alcohol. Alcohol, by nature, inhibits antidiuretic hormone, so alcohol causes vasodilation, right? Um, our long-term body mechanism for handling all of these different things that can control our blood pressure levels right? Um, are direct renal mechanisms. Your kidneys help control more of this than, than you realize. Your kidneys are super important. And we will likely harp more on that during your urinary system unit when we get an in-depth look at the kidneys and the like how your kidneys function. Um, but for right now, just know your kidneys are super important to this process. Um, because blood flow will also increase or decrease, depending on if it's going up or down, it will increase the rate of kidney filtration. Right? Um, this is where you're going to get into some fun words, such as this. Right? Um, hypovolemic, hypervolemia. Right? Hypo, under. Volemic, volume, emia is blood, so low blood volume here. Literally, it means low blood volume. That can be caused by anything from you're sick and vomiting and you're not holding on to all of your stuff. Maybe you have cholera, so you're vomiting and you have diarrhea. Maybe you're super dehydrated. Maybe you were in a bad car accident and you're bleeding a lot. 
You could have severe burns from like being stuck out in that desert that dehydrated you. Hypertension, that means high blood pressure for whatever reason. Hi hypertension medicines, which are trying to lower your blood pressure if they get the dosage wrong. Whatever the cause here, you have low blood volume. That is bad. Technically, you will be you could be diagnosed with hypovolemia at 10 to 20 percent blood loss, right? Hypervolemia. Hyper means too much, right? Heightened too much blood volume, right? This is excessive fluid volume. This could mean that you are retaining water or salt because salt likes to hold on to water. Remember, you get super thirsty after you eat a bunch of salty foods. This could be endemic of things like heart failure, liver disease, kidney disease, all these kind of things like steroid treatments, hyperaldosteronism, that kind of stuff. These things can be bad, right? <laughs> Let's see. So these things can be very bad. If you are holding on to liquid and not getting rid of it, this is where we get into this lovely picture. If you are holding on to fluid and you're not getting rid of it because things are not flowing correctly, you can start to swell. Your proper medical term for swelling is edema, right? This means you're swelling up. If you've ever seen somebody with congestive heart failure who is retaining water, and you could literally, just like the picture here is, you could poke a part of them, and you see the poke, like the poke stays as though they were bread dough consistency, for lack of a better term. That's not good. That could be indicative of high blood pressure, heart failure, kidney failure, a number of things. This is normally a symptom of something that's wrong. It's not a disease itself, but for whatever reason, either your kidneys are failing, heart failure, whatever's happening to your body, you are holding on to fluid to such a degree that your veins cannot hold it all. And this is going to increase the interstitial fluid around your body, meaning you may be here and be able to poke down because people are holding onto their fluid. They're going to get squishy. Um, that's called edema. That is not good, right? Objective number eight was describe hypertension, including causes, symptoms, and implications. We know that hypotension is low blood pressure. Hypertension is high blood pressure. There is also a temporary high blood pressure called orthostatic hypertension. That is when your blood pressure spikes a little bit when you sit up and stand up from a lying down position. So that's dizziness immediately after standing up. If you work with our elderly population, help them get up. Don't just like leave them to stand up on their own. And if they get dizzy when they sit up and are about to stand up, go ahead and just like reassure them and tell them that they can sit there as long as they need so that they don't get up and promptly faint or something. That could cause more damage than just letting them sit there for a minute before you help them out of the doctor's office or whatever. Um, hypertension is high blood pressure that is considered to be a silent killer, especially in the United States. It can lead to heart attack, stroke, aneurysms, uh, which is basically a blood clot got loose and a blood vessel burst in the head. Um, peripheral, peripheral artery disease, kidney disease, or kidney failure. Hypertension and high blood pressure can affect and destroy a lot of things. Right? Right, and we have, like, objective number nine was discuss the clinical significance of systole, diastolic, and pulse pressure. We've already talked about that a little bit, right? Systole was ventricular contraction. Diastolic was ventricular relaxation. Pulse pressure was the difference between systolic and diastolic. Should be 25% of systolic. If things are too low than, lower than they should be, it's called hypotension. If things are higher than it should be, it's hypertension. And that's it for this video. We're going to talk about some of the specific things to remember in your last one. It won't, it shouldn't be very long. All right? Have a wonderful day.